Okay, thank you for coming today. It's it's really um, great to have Anna Sunborder here. She is recent uh, new faculty at the Hormel Institute in Austin, Minnesota, which she just told me is on the border with Iowa, <laughs> and that there's not much to do unless you like spam, which I don't believe you. <laughs> I think it's it's actually pretty down there. So. Um, Anna completed her early training in Linköping uh, University in Linköping, Sweden. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Kind of, sort of. <laughs> Linköping, Sweden. Um, so she was in um, a student in molecular biology or med medical biology, and then her uh, PhD was completed at the Karolinska Institute um, in neuroscience. And then she was awarded an NIH fellow um, postdoctoral fellowship, and she completed her postdoc at the NIH, and then was recruited to the Hormel Institute. And she's an expert in um, the control of membrane remodeling and trafficking events. And she's going to talk to her, us today about her work in cryo-EM. Um, she's an assistant professor and section leader in cryo-EM and in the molecular biology, um, cell, molecular and cellular biology section at the Hormel. So thank you for uh, traveling to us today. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very excited to be up here with more more than spam and yeah it's exciting you all should come down to austin by the way and check it out it's pretty cool so i will talk to you guys today about cell death machineries and specifically with an emphasis on membrane trafficking and then touch up on uh, cryo em because that's what i do and that's what i'm trying to sort of get you guys excited about because I'm looking for partner partners in science and people that are interested in structure. So let's see how this works. So uh, my lab focuses on membrane remodeling during cell death. And obviously, I'm at our cancer institute. We're all here at the Masonic Cancer Center. The, the overall goal is to understand how we could use um, programmed cell death um, pathways to kill cancer cells. So I'm very basic in my science, and it's we're kind of trying to figure out how these pathways are regulated, and specifically how they are regulated by membrane remodeling proteins. <coughs> so during my PhD, I studied a protein called dynamin, and dynamin is, a, is an enzyme that mediates plasma membrane fission. So Dynamin is an example of one type of protein that regulates membrane remodeling. Another group of proteins are bar proteins. And today I will focus on the partnership between dynamins and endothelins. So bar proteins, they have uh, the ability to sense and induce membrane curvature. And there's a huge group of them. Oops. There's a huge group of them, and they are basically divided into three classes based on the characteristics of their bar domain, and the bar domain is the one that does the membrane remodeling. And the, the protein that I'm interested in is called endothelin, and it's an N-bar protein. And here are crystal structures of the bar domains. So basically two bar proteins come together, their bar domains dimerize, and they form this banana-shaped structure and this is the structure that's thought to bind to the membrane and induce its shape onto the membrane. So it's scaffolding the membrane. And if you have an F-bar protein, it's causing a shallow curvature. And N-bar protein, like endothelin, is causing high curvature. And then we have these mysterious I-bar proteins that are causing inverse curvatures. And no one really knows what they're doing. So there's a bunch of different bar proteins, and I'm interested in M-bar proteins. And another interesting thing about them is that they have an amphipathic helix in their N-terminal domain that inserts into the lipid. So they're not just causing shape by scaffolding. They're also inserting something in the membrane, causing um, the lipid to be destabilized. So that's pr probably a very important aspect to this. So endothelin, like I mentioned, here are some EM images of the endothelin that we are specifically interested in, endothelin B1. So endothelins are very small proteins. They have basically a bar domain and an SH3 domain that's involved in protein interactions. So like I mentioned, endothelin will come together with another uh, protein, and this bar domain will 
cause this banana-shaped dimer. <coughs> and what happens when you add endothelin to spherical liposomes uh, is that it's going to tubulate these spherical liposomes into long tubes. So this is just an EM micrograph of endothelin B1 added to these liposomes and then stained uh, for contrast. And this is a high magnification image that is supposed to illustrate that endothelin actually forms a spiral around the tube. So that's the mode of its tubulation activity. It forms a spiral that squeezes the liposome. So the other protein family that I mentioned is the dynamin family, and they regulate membrane trafficking by inducing fission and fusion. So here are some examples of dynamins. The one that I have studied and that I will talk about today is classical dynamin, and it's involved in fission from the plasma membrane, fission from endosomes, uh, fission from Golgi, and then there are other members of the dynamin family that are doing fission and fusion of mitochondria, uh, uh, fusion of uh, ER, <coughs> and then there's a really weird group of dynamins that are doing antiviral activity, like one member of the dynamin family, MXB, was recently shown to be uh, uh, active against HIV-1 infection, and no one really knows how. I might mention IRGM, which is another really small dynamin family member that is also involved in some kind of um, activity against infection. So dynamin, the classical dynamin that I've worked on, also forms a spiral around lipids. And that's also the mode of its tubulation activity. So dynamin, it's a, it's a GTPase. It's about 100 kilodalton. It assembles, it self-assembles into large scaffolds that form spirals around liposomes. And if you imagine that this tubulated liposome, it's about the same diameter as the neck of a clapping-coated pit. So during endocytosis, you have these invaginate, and dynamin uh, forms a spiral around that membrane. And then during our yet-to-be-defined enzymatic activity, it undergoes conformational changes and then severs the membrane. And that's what I've been using cryo-EM for in the past during my postdoc, is to try to reconstruct the dynamin scaffold and then study it using cryo-EM to basically try to understand how dynamin mediates fission. And these are some examples of uh, these uh, cryo-EM density maps that we produce. This is a dynamin construct that does not have a PRV domain, but essentially it forms this kind of structure. This is, the, this is a cross-section. If you imagine that you have the tube like this and then you just cut right through it, and you can see here is the lipid bilayer. Here's the inner lumen, and here's the protein scaffold, and here's the GTPase domain of dynamin, and here is uh, uh, the what we call the stock domain, basically the domain that is uh, responsible for self-assembly, and here's the leg domain of dynamin that has a pH domain that actually also, just like endothelin, inserts into the membrane. So both dynamin and endothelin have the ability to insert parts of their domains into the lipid and cause destabilization of the lipid, which probably has a lot to do with how they are active in, in fission. So this is kind of the current theory of how dynamin mediates fission. And I worked on plasma membrane fission, but it's probably most likely the same whatever the membrane is. So, and it's probably a lot of similarities between fusion and fission. You basically form these unstable uh, membrane intermediates. So what we think is that dynamin assembles around the necks of these clatrin-coated pits. So this is, if you imagine the plasma membrane being invaginated like this, and this clatrin-coated pit would be filled with cargo, or it could be a receptor, like this is really crucial during downregulation of EGFR, for instance, or something from the cell surface. So dynamin will come form a scaffold around this neck, and then it will squeeze the neck, and then it will hydrolyze GTP, and during this hydrolysis step, it's going to, the scaffold is going to undergo some kind of conformational change that's going to cause even more stress on the membrane, and then that's going to cause the vesicle to be released. And that's kind of still magical, because we don't really understand how it works. And my work has been to try to elucidate how that works, so I'm not there yet, 
but also to try to figure out how other proteins like endothelin are regulating this process. So I will kind of come back to that. So, so that's just to keep in mind when it comes to what dynamin and endothelin might ultimately do. So as I mentioned, or I may not have mentioned, they interact with each other. So endothelin has this SH3 domain that binds to the PRD domain of dynamin or proline rich domain. So this has been shown in pretty much all tissues. These two proteins are binding partners. They co-localize all that stuff. But up until now, it's not really been known why they interact. What's the point of them binding to each other? People in the past thought that maybe endothelin recruited dynamin to site. And that's not the case. <coughs> so one very important process that they are involved in is, as I mentioned, plasma-mediated endocytosis. So one um, process that plasma-mediated endocytosis is involved in is recycling of synaptic vesicles. And when I was in grad school, I was at the Department of Neuroscience, and that was basically only because we used a model system to study plasma-mediated endocytosis that used uh, the nerve terminal of these, I should have shown a picture, these really gross fish that, that are called lampreys. I don't know if you guys are familiar. So they are parasites sitting on bigger fish, eating their gunk, whatever. And, they're, and they have these teeth, round, yeah, horrible fangs. So <laughs> the, the good thing about lampreys is that they have spinal cords that run the entire length of the animal. And then they have uh, reticular spinal axons that are huge that run the entire length of the spinal cord. So for, <coughs> for microinjections, for EM, for anything where you want to visualize a process, they are excellent. So we would isolate the spinal cord, put it in our chamber, use electrodes to impale the axons, inject a bunch of stuff, and then we would use just conventional EM to look to see what happened in the nerve terminal with this process. And what I specifically was interested in was what happens with dynamin. How is dynamin recruitment affected by perturbing endothelin, for instance? So we use this fish for that, and we use synaptic vesicle recycling. But basically, what we wanted to know was how is, uh, how is membrane recycled, and how is clathromediated and cytosis controlled? So I will show you a bunch of pictures from nerve terminals, but you can imagine that this happens in all cells. So this is not nerve cell specific by any means. And this is an image of a nerve terminal from one of these lamprey reticulospinal axons. And another cool thing about these nerve terminals is that they are, if you compare to mammalian nerve terminals, all the vesicles are just everywhere. It's really messy. It's you can't really see a defined area of where you have endocytosis and where you have exocytosis. It's pretty much happening all at the same place. Here, it's very compartmentalized. These are all synaptic vesicles. So these are all fusing here in the active zone with the presynaptic membrane. You are the only participant. Here is a postsynaptic dendrite. These are all mitochondria. In here is the synaptic cleft. So these vesicles are all going to fuse. And then the membrane is going to be recycled here. So this is the endocytic zone. So this is what we were interested in trying to understand basically how these structures, platform coated pits, how they were formed and how they <laughs> cut and remade in the vesicle and You are the only And this is 5 hertz stimulation, which is physiological levels. So there's a balance between endo and exocytosis. The cell is really happy. We have some platform coated pits accumulated, but basically everything is, is working fine. So what we wanted to know in this system we perturb the interaction between the dynamic and proteins that are involved in regulating the membrane. What's going to happen with synaptic vesicle recycling? And so in a sense, what's happening with clathromediated endocytosis when we perturb their interaction? So what we did was that we microinjected a peptide called PP19, and then so we injected a peptide that's going to bind to endothelin, preventing it to bind to dynamin. And then we evoked endocytosis by stimulating at 5 hertz. So basically, this is what we did. 
PP19 sits on the SH3 domain of endophilin, so endophilin can't bind dynamin anymore. And then we look to see cardinal. It looks completely different. So I can hear him just fine. Pretty much. Okay, we're good. So this is again we successfully the connected here. All the synaptic vesicles. There's about an average of 400 synaptic vesicles per nerve terminal, and here we can count them pretty much. Yeah, we can easily see that there is a, a depletion of synaptic vesicles. We see uh, uh, these intermediates, but basically what's happened is that we have depleted the synaptic vesicle cluster. All the membrane is trapped here in the synaptic or in the, in the active zone or in the endocytic zone. So there's no endocytosis. And if we look to see what happens with dynamic localization, so what we, do was, what we did was that we looked at these intermediates and we use immunogold labeling, and we try to detect where dynamin is on the neck, where it's supposed to form the spiral, and we saw that we have significantly less dynamin localized to the area where it should be forming the spiral and causing fish. So essentially, what we found was that if you acutely perturb the interaction between dynamin and endophilin, you're going to block recycling of synaptic vesicles, and uh, you're going to prevent proper recruitment and assembly of dynamin on next exoplasmic cryptids. So the take-home message is endophilin is important for positioning of dynamin and assembly of dynamin. And if we go to an in vitro system where we again have these <coughs> round liposomes that I showed you in the beginning, that both of these proteins will tubulate. If we use those and and use them as a in vitro template for the plasma membrane, and we look to see how much dynamin is binding to this lipid template, kind of like a recruitment assay. If we do it with and without endophilin, we see a significant increase in dynamin recruitment in the presence of endophilin. So again, showing evidence that endophilin is actually positively regulating dynamin binding to lipid. And if we block their interaction again, with PP19, we abolish that positive effect. So what we thought was that probably what's happening is that they're forming an actual micromolecular complex on these um, nexoclatin codipids. The problem is, if we want to investigate this, doing any kind of, of visualization, structural stuff, these clatin codipids are so tiny. They're about 50 nanometers high. We don't have any resolution. So what we did was that we microinjected GTP gamma S, which is a non-hydrolyzable analog of GTP, and we forced these necks to grow longer by preventing dynamin from finalizing this fission reaction. So if there's no GTP hydrolysis, we're not going to get the fission, so dynamin is going to keep growing longer and longer and longer. So we essentially have a longer neck where we can look to see do these proteins co-localize at the point where they're supposed to cause fission? These are, of course, not natural. So normally they would be like this long. But we're just increasing the length of the neck to see if both proteins are there. So we did immunogo labeling for endophilin and dynamin, and we find that they do indeed both localize to these structures. Interestingly, endophilin only localizes to this very top part of the neck. So right underneath the coat is where endophilin sits. Dynamin is everywhere, but it kind of makes sense because it's the inability of dynamin to mediate fission that causes these necks to grow because dynamin is actually continuously forming a spiral. But the, the point is that in this area, they are co-localized. So the next thing we did, and now we're getting to the actual cryo part. So we decided to investigate if they actually form a micromolecular complex in vitro. So we have evidence that they are interacting in vivo. Uh, they co-localize on these uh, clatin coated pits in vivo. What happens if we just express the proteins, mix them together, and add them to liposomes? So we have here three different situations where we have looked at dynamin alone, endophilin alone, and then dynamin and endophilin together. So these are, again, big spherical liposomes that have been tubulated by the force of these two proteins forming spirals. Dynamin alone 
this darker area here is the inner lumen. And protein shows up in white here. This is negative stain EM. So you can see the dynamin is forming kind of like a T structure. And you're seeing this kind of like a cross section. This is a tube. And what's happened is that under the weight of the stain, it's collapsed. And that's why we can see the contours of the inner lumen. But really, we don't see inside the tube. We're just seeing it, the contours of the inner lumen because the tube has collapsed. And that's because this is a pretty wide tube. And the fill-in is much thinner. And you can kind of see some hints of a spiral, like you can see hints of a striation pattern. But this protein is much smaller. So it's not as obvious as with dynamin. The big thing here, though, is obviously to see the difference between these three different situations. And the point is to show that if you mix dynamin and the fill-in together, they form something that is decidedly distinct from what, what they form by themselves. So this is evidence that they form some kind of complex. And we can use immunogold labeling for endophyllin and dynamin and, and label these tubes perfectly. <coughs> so we know that both proteins are actually in this structure, whatever this is. So what I was working on as a, as a postdoc and a graduate student, actually, I was in the same lab, was trying to figure out what the structure of this complex is using cryo-EM, and it proved much more complicated than I thought because the whole point of cryo-EM and single particle reconstruction is that you have a perfectly homogeneous sample that you take pictures of and then you average the images. You have thousands and thousands of particles. The problem with these tubes is that they're so heterogeneous that averaging sort of blurs out the, the actual features. So we right now have, after 10 years of working on this, we have a preliminary map. Oh, it's the next slide. Well, basically, this is, again, just characterizing what this micromolecular complex, what it is, and just showing, again, that it's actually distinct. So this is the different conditions in negative stain. So here you have, you've added a stain that binds to the protein. So you lose some of the detail. It's, it's blurrier, it's bigger. This is cryo. So here you just have your protein trapped in ice, no stain. So there's no contrast or very much less contrast. But you also get just the, the natural protein. So here you see a tube where you have dynamin and endophyllin together. Again, dynamin and endophyllin together. Here's dynamin alone, and here's endophyllin. So the big difference is that the spiral pitch is much bigger when they are mixed together. It's actually doubled. So we've, did, we've done some, some measurements here. So what happens if they're mixed together is that there's still a spiral. It's stretched out. There's doubling in pitch. So the distance between rungs of the spiral is 20 instead of 10 nanometers. And that's kind of important, so keep that in mind. <coughs> the other thing is that the tube is much smaller, or the diameter is smaller. So it's as if the protein structure formed by the proteins together has, if you imagine a foam cord, like those old style foam cords, if anyone remembers them at all, if you take it and you stretch it out, it becomes narrower and it becomes extended. <laughs> so that's what happens when they are mixed together. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you add GDP to the dynamic tubes, they fragment. So that's kind of attributed to dynamic mediating fission. Yeah. So this is a preliminary 3D reconstruction that I mentioned. So this is actually where we are right now. And Hormel are very generous, so they bought a new, super awesome Titan Creos microscope. So now we have no technical reasons for not being able to get a real reconstruction. Now it's just having better samples and working more. So, so this is the workflow that we have built at the Hormel Institute. So basically what we're doing is that we are preparing samples, putting it on grids, plunge freezing it, analyzing it in the microscope, taking thousands of pictures, and then in each of these pictures, you identify which one is your, we call it particles. We have tubes. So what you do is that you take these tubes and you, you 
uh, divide them up into segments. Each segment is a particle. And then when you have maybe 100,000 of these particles or segments, you process them and you generate a 3D reconstruction. And as I mentioned before, you want these particles to be identical because when you're going through these processing iterations, the more different they are, the less detailed the reconstruction is going to be. I hope that makes sense. That was very much not a good explanation for cryo -EM, but similar is better because it is an averaging technique as opposed to tomography where you're reconstructing a unique structure. So we have a problem with similarity. These segments are not identical, and that's because the tubes are heterogeneous. The diameter is different. The, the spiral is not perfectly, the pitch is not perfectly symmetrical. Yeah, it has problems. So we're working on this and hoping that a better camera is going to give us a higher signal in every micrograph. But it's a work in progress. But basically what we find when we look at this 3D reconstruction is that it's very different from dynamic by itself. And we already kind of knew that from the negative thing and the cryo images. But what we're hoping to do is to actually use this density map to see how is dynamic and in the fluent organized in this density, because that's the point. What we're trying to figure out is how is endophilin uh, regulating dynamic? Why is it important to be there in the first place? So the question kind of is, oh yeah, this is just boxing out showing you that there are so many different structures in here that it's impossible to get a better reconstruction. I mean, yes, generally. In this case, I know I only have two proteins. So the problem here is that they're forming variable structures. So, right, but in the cell, in the fluid, well, in the excellent question. I mean, I think that that's unfortunately far beyond the reach of this. But I'd say if you were looking at it in a cell, the structure that forms to actually mediate fission is so, I mean, it's, it has to be super efficient. So you probably have the easiest possible structure to form, like as few molecules as possible. So I think it's probably very homogeneous if you compare different fission events. Yeah, so I mean, it should be. And, and then that would be advantageous for cryo-EM, but it also would be advantageous for the cell to form a uniform structure. So, oh yeah, so the question is, of course, what's the form of forming this complex, or what's the point? I mean, this is not just something that is cool looking that I think I should reconstruct because it's fun. I think it actually has some kind of purpose. And what I think, and this kind of speaks towards what I think endophilin is doing in the cell in general. Uh, so this is a, a cross section again of our micromolecular complex endophilin dynamin just a different color scheme from the one that you saw before. It's the same density map. So if you imagine that this is cross length of the tube, and here you see the protein scaffold, and in here somewhere is the lipid. We actually don't have enough resolution to resolve the lipid bilayer. It's here somewhere in this density. And here's the inner lumen of the tube. This is a comparison to dynamin that I showed you in the, in the beginning. This is about 11 angstroms. So this is probably 40 angstroms. So it's, it's very, very low resolution at the moment. But you can see the same overall structure. You have this what we call T structure, where the G domain is forming this, these, this head here. And then you have a stalk and a pH domain. So this, this same characteristic is seen here. But then the major difference is, like I said before, the pitch is very different between the spiral rungs. And here, there's just a big blobby mess, which is because of poor resolution, but also because we are looking at two proteins now. It's not just dynamic. So one thing that we did that I found to be pretty interesting was that we took the density map 
that was, at this point, just recently solved by itself. So endothelin is about half the size of dynamin. So this is the density map of endothelin A1. And interestingly, it fits perfectly in this space right here, in this density. And it makes sense because endothelin, like I mentioned, of course, is a membrane binding protein. So it makes sense that it would be close to the bilayer. And then this is the yellow part here. You can barely see it. That's actually the, um, the crystal structure of the SH3 domain that they fit into their structure. So you have endothelin where it's these tops here, these peaks, are fitting the SH3 domain that binds dynamin. So it kind of makes sense for endothelin to be in this density. But we need much better resolution to be able to And this, yeah, this is just showing that in a 3D reconstruction that we did, the, the endothelin binding part of dynamin would be accessible. So that's not really important. But so this is kind of the point to all of this. So we think that endothelin and dynamin, they are forming a complex. And the point of this is for endothelin to regulate dynamin assembly. And I mentioned that there's some stark differences between endothelin and dynamin together and dynamin alone. This is dynamin alone. Again, the pitch is about 10 nanometers. If we look at them together, it's 20. The width of the spiral is it's much more constricted. So what we think is happening is that endothelin is actually a template for dynamin. So during recruitment of all these proteins to the site of fission, so in this case, we're looking at clatin-mediated endocytosis in the nerve terminal. So we know from previous studies that both of these proteins are in the vesicle cluster at rest, and then you stimulate, you evoke endocytosis. They both end up here somehow. So what we think is happening is that endothelin is actually recruited to the next clatin pits. It's generating this really high curvature, and then dynamin is recruited just separately, not dependent on endothelin. It's recruited and it hangs out of the clatin coat, and then when the curvature or the, I would say the diameter of the neck is appropriate, dynamin is going to start assembling. So this is a point where we have a dynamin endothelin complex, but endothelin needs to be there, one, to generate this constriction, because dynamin doesn't like when it's not constricted enough. And also, dynamin needs an anchoring point. So we think that endothelin just forms kind of like a base for dynamin underneath the coat, and then dynamin comes in, and then it forms a scaffold, but it's sort of locked in by endothelin, which would spatially and temporally regulate where dynamin can mediate fission. So that's, and then <clears throat> the, the, the fact that we see a bigger pitch when they're, when they're mixed together, we think, is evidence that endothelin is actually a negative regulator of fission because it's, it's causing dynamin assembly to be spaced out so that dynamin cannot form uh, dimerizations of G domains between rungs. And I did not explain that at all, but basically dynamin to mediate fission. I mentioned that it's, uh, it's an enzyme. It binds GTP, it hydrolyzes GTP. That's required for fission. But for this GTP hydrolysis to happen, dynamin actually has to have a dimerization event between rungs where two G domains come together and form dimers. So for that to happen, you need a very close opposition between rungs. And what endothelin is doing, based on our structure, is that it's pulling these rungs apart. So you cannot have that dimerization event anymore. So we think endothelin is a template causing constriction of the neck, causing yeah, appropriate curvature for dynamic assembly. But then it's actually regulating, making sure that dynamic can't, it can't undergo fission until something else has happened, something else has been recruited, or or something else that needs to happen before dynamic just cuts the vesicle. So that's kind of the story. That's dynamic and endothelin and plasma membrane fission. 
it's an ongoing project trying to get high resolution of that complex. What I've been doing in my new lab is looking at other dynamic family members and other endophilins because I think the fact that they form a complex, it's not specific to plasma membrane fission. It's actually a general mechanism <coughs> that regulates membrane remodeling in the cell for other purposes beyond clathrin-mediated endocytosis. So I'm interested in other dynamic family members that are also doing memory remodeling. So specifically, dynamic 2, which looks like dynamic 1, DRP1 that's doing mitochondrial fission, and then IRGM, which is this enigmatic teeny tiny dynamic that is doing something. And I'm specifically interested in it because it's been shown to be involved in autophagy and mitochondrial fission. So it's like a partner to DRP1. So my overall interest is to find out if these are also regulated by endophilins or other bar proteins. So the new project that we have in the lab is looking at endophilin B1, dynamic 2, and autophagy. Because as I mentioned way back in the beginning, my interest is in program cell death. So this is a really busy slide. There are some take-home messages here. Basically, endophilin B1, which has the same role as endophilin A1, it's a scaffolding protein that does membrane remodeling, possibly just doing this tube formation. So this one is on Golgi. So it's been shown to be involved in the formation of the autophagosome. So early, early during autophagy, it is recruited to different sources of autophagosome formation because the autophagosome can be formed from plasma membrane, Golgi, ER, and endophilin B1 is there to cause tubulation. So this is just showing that it's causing tubulation of ATG9 positive membrane. So ATG9 is another early autophagy protein. So endophilin B1 causing curvature of tubes from Golgi. And then a recent paper showed that endophilin or dynamin 2 comes in and cuts these tubes. So just like dynamin and endophilin in plasma membrane fission forming these clathrin coated pits, during autophagosome formation, endophilin and dynamin, they are loca localized to Golgi where they cut these Golgi tubules and they give, uh, they become the, the membrane source for the autophagosome. So <coughs> our idea is that uh, endophilin and dynamin are forming the same kind of micromolecular complex regulating Golgi uh, fragmentation basically to form the autophagosome. And it's been shown that if you remove endophilin B1, you don't have autophagy. So it's, it's essential for autophagy. So we think that this is happening. Here's Golgi and here is ATG9 and dynamin forms a spiral around these endophilin B1 uh, tubules. And then these vesicles, they start forming the autophagosome with all these other autophagy proteins. So the ongoing work now is trying to recreate this endophilin B1 dynamin 2 micromolecular complex, much like we did with dynamin and endophilin that I just showed you, hopefully getting more homogeneous structures. And we will do that by using different lipid templates. Uh, pretty much trying to reconstitute Golgi in vitro and then having these two proteins form uh, what we think is a spiral and then trying to use cryo-EM to reconstruct the spiral to get high resolution information about how they are organized to ultimately try to understand how endophilin B1, endophilin A1 regulates dynamic mediated membrane fission. So this is just some really basic work that we've been doing <coughs> that goes into all cryo-EM projects. You have to basically purify your proteins to perfect purity, just like in crystallography. You need to do gel filtration to make sure that if you think you have a complex with two proteins, that they're actually in the same gel filtration peak. So this is our endophilin B1 dynamin 2 gel filtration showing a complex that would correspond to a tetramer of dynamin and a tetramer of endophilin B1. So that's what we're working on now, putting this on grids, trying to get good samples for the creos that is 
finally up and running. And this is just some preliminary EM that we've been doing. So basically, we just confirmed that endothelin B1 on these spherical lysosomes forms the same kind of tubules that endothelin A1 does. Dynamin 2 behaves just like uh, dynamin 1, again, forming tubules with these spirals. As of yet, we don't see any tubules forming with the proteins mixed together. We just see this weird crystal-looking structure. This is actually what we're working on right now. That I, that I hope my postdoc is working on right now when I'm here. <laughs> so another thing that I will just briefly mention, because it it's actually speaks to the, the uh, general mechanism of endothelins, that is a separate project that we have in the lab, is the role of endothelin in apoptosis. <coughs> and I've mentioned that endothelin B1 uh, and endothelin A1 they are involved in regulating dynamin assembly. So this is another cell death membrane remodeling protein that's not a dynamin, and it's Bax, and you guys are all familiar with Bax and how it forms pores that are, of course, essential for apoptosis. So there's evidence that endothelin B1 regulates the pore formation, Bax pore formation, and no one really knows how, and no one really knows why? So the current understanding is that Bax is auto-inhibited, where it has basically this amphipathic helix that it's locking it in, in this inactive configuration. And then when a protein from this activator BH3-only protein family comes in and, and shoves their amphipathic helix into this groove, it activates Bax, or it allows it to become active to form these pores. Uh, so what we're thinking is that endothelin could potentially be a source for one of these amphipathic helices, because it has two. So this is what we're working on now, to see if endothelin, much like it's regulating dynamic assembly, if it's also regulating Bax assembly to promote apoptosis. So we have some extremely preliminary data and we just bought a new Biocor instrument. So this was just testing the Biocor instrument. And my postdoc had some Bax and some endothelin B1. So he was lucky enough to get like 10 minutes on the Biocor so he could just show that uh, in vitro these proteins actually interact. So what he's working on now is trying to come up with a, a good lipid template that would be essentially mimicking the mitochondrial outer membrane. And what we want to do ultimately is to, of course, try to recreate Bax pore formation to see is endothelin B1 essential for regulating how Bax forms pores in the mitochondria. Yeah, so you just have different endothelin B1 and Bax constructs. So <coughs> the very last little section, because um, I've talked about how endothelins regulate dynamin. And the fact is that it's way more complicated because we have evidence that dynamins and maybe Bax proteins also regulate endothelins. So there's really old evidence from 10 years ago. We worked on another protein called Sindapin. So Sindapin is also a bar protein. It has a slightly different bar domain. If you remember from the beginning, it's more shallow. So it forms more shallow curvatures. It also interacts with dynamic and is involved in different kinds of endocytosis. But basically, the problem with sinapin is that it's auto-inhibited. So it also has an SH3 domain and a bar domain, but under native conditions, it's, it's uh, folded over, so it's auto-inhibited. So the SH3 domain is preventing the bar domain from dimerizing with another sinapin and causing curvature. So that's why if you look at sinapin full length in the presence of these PS liposomes, you're not going to see very many tubes. But if you look at the bartamine alone, you see a lot of these tubes. And it was also confirmed by crystallization that there's actually a binding site between the SH3 and the bartamine. Interestingly, if you add the PRD domain of dynamin to these wild type and sinapin tubes, you restore tubulation. And also, if you mutate the SH3 domain of sinapin, 
so that it can't bind the bartomaine, you also restore tribulation. So sinopin is auto-inhibited, but if you add dynamin, it's going to unlock it, and then sinopin can dimerize and go to the membrane and tubulate. And there's recent biochemistry data showing that other bartomains or bartomain proteins, including endophilin, they also have this auto-inhibition. So they also have this binding between the SS3 and the bartomain, which, so this is kind of the model of what we think this means. This is in solution, the bartomains, bartomain proteins are basically inactive. But when it comes in contact with a friend, like Dynamin, they are unlocked, and then they can tubulate. So what that means, essentially, is that not only is endophilin regulating Dynamin assembly, but Dynamin, and maybe Vax, could also be regulating endophilin assembly and function. So they're regulating each other. And this is just... Uh, showing that endophilin, I've mentioned some examples of where endophilin is involved, clathrimidine and cytosis and autophagy, but uh, when it comes to, to cell death pathways, endophilin is everywhere. So this brings me to like our overall sort of hypothesis. So we have shown that endophilin A1 promotes recruitment and assembly of dynamin to sites of, of clathrin-mediated enzytosis and nerve terminals. And there's uh, evidence in cells that endophilin is involved in regulating recruitment of Bax to mitochondria. So, and there's also evidence that endophilins are locked or auto-inhibited. So we think that Endophilins promote recruitment and assembly of binding partners, uh, membrane remodeling effectors like dynamins and Bax, and that dynamins and Bax proteins actually unlock endophilins. So they are recruited, and then they come there, and then they unlock endophilins, and then the endophilins can cause membrane tubulation. And then upon membrane tubulation or membrane constriction, Dynamin can assemble and mediate fission, and Bax can form a pore. So it's essentially a recipro reciprocal regulation that coordinates membrane remodeling. So if you want to have membrane fission, you need to have endophilin come in, recruit dynamin, dynamin forms a scaffold, and it mediates fission. If you need to have pore formation and apoptosis, endophilin needs to come in, do something with the mitochondrial outer membrane, prepare it nicely for Bax, Bax comes in and forms a pore. If you need autophagy, endophilin needs to come in, squeeze the Golgi to form tubes, Dynamin comes in, forms a scaffold, severs the vesicle. So essentially, we think that that's a general mechanism. We have bar proteins that come in, prepare the membrane, and then effector proteins like Dynamins and Bax come in and do the fission or fusion or whatever needs to happen. So it's a partnership. And that, with that, I will acknowledge people that have worked on this. So I have currently one postdoc, Veer, who's really great. He's learning cryo-EM. Uh, our cryo-EM facility manager, Bob, is really awesome too. This is my old lab where I did my postdoc and my PhD in Jenny Hinshaw's lab at the NIH. And this is my other uh, lab where I did my uh, PhD at the neuroscience department at Karolinska with Oleg Shapirkov, and we had a lot of help from people in Volker Hauke's lab in Berlin. So with that, I will take questions. Oh, and also, I'm supposed to show this slide to do PR for our new cryo-EM lab, and if anyone is interested in doing cryo-EM, you have a, a project in mind, please contact us at either of these email addresses. And we'll be happy to talk to you. Yeah, questions? Yeah. So can you just briefly tell us about the these proteins in cancer? Are they dysregulated, or would they be preventing apoptosis, for example? Excellent question. That's, that's kind of where I'm trying to go. So endophilin B1, if you knock it out, 
you have spontaneous tumor formation. So it's, it's considered to be a tumor suppressor, and it's possibly due to the fact that it's regulating endosomal maturation. So, I mean, essentially, in all cases where you have upregulation of EGFR, all those cancers. Is that what model system? So knockout mouse or? Mouse, yes, and also all cancer cell lines that you can imagine, yeah. But yeah, so it's, it's a tumor suppressor, but it's not 100% understood what it's doing exactly. It's also shown to, if you overexpress, you get, uh, no, if you, if, you, if you remove it, you get migra cell migration. So it's also thought to be, like especially in triple knockout breast cancer cells, you get more uh, cell migration in those cells if you remove endosomal B1. And what did you say about the EGF connection? So EGFR, if you have upregulation, so I mean, since you have upregulation in most cancer cells, the the thought is that endosomal B1 is involved in the maturation of endosomes. So the endosomal pathway to take down EGFR, it's kind of blocked where you go from early to late endosomes if you remove endosomal B1. So dynamin and endothelin, they are all involved in downregulation of receptors, including EGFR, but it's probably somewhere where the endosomes are going to fuse with the lysosomes, where there's a problem. So they can be internally signaling, in other words, for prolonged periods of time, or they can be removed from the surface. So what happens, I think, most likely, is that they are left on the surface, so you just have continuous, like, sustained ERK signaling forever and ever and ever. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Do you know if there's any evidence that since you have a cell death signal coming in, that there's any evidence that there's post-translational modification of these proteins that affect their interaction with each other or that intramolecular interactions to keep them from interacting with other proteins? Excellent question. I never looked at that. And it's like dynamin, for instance, is the one that I know most of. And there's so many post-translational modifications like normally, oh, in the absence okay, of so cancer. Have, they do have. Yeah, but okay. the complexity of that in a cancer environment, I mean, that could very much be a factor. But that's not something that I've looked into specifically, but I'm very much interested in doing. Okay, thanks. Thanks. <coughs> Very nice talk. Um, you showed uh, one slide uh, uh, having I IRGM, and then it showed the um, homology in the GTPase uh, domain, and then there's uh, uh, two other gray yeah. uh, gray this colors. Mystery. Right? Uh, how could uh, it be homologous to uh, dynamin family members? That's an excellent question. So it it's it's actually grouped into the the category of interferon-induced atypical GTPases. So it's the big dynamin family are proteins that have G domains that have the ability to self-assemble. So, and that's basically, say, 10 proteins. So IRGM falls into that category, but it doesn't have any other homology with dynamin. And it's actually been called into question if it even has a G domain. And the, the fact that, I'm trying to find that slide, but the fact that it's so, let's see. Yeah, so the fact that this is all gray, there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of weird annotations like there's not a lot done with IRGM. So IRG is a group of proteins that are very highly expressed in mouse. And IRGM is the human form and humans only have one gene. I think mice have six. So there's a lot of structural evidence from the, the work done in, in, with the IRG proteins. So a lot of this is inferred from work done with other genes the G domain looks very similar to Dynamin's G domain, but it doesn't have any of the other domains that Dynamin has. It's just assumed, since it looks like the mouse IRGs 
that can self-assemble and mediate GPT hydrolysis. But yeah, this is, yeah, huge question mark, and it might actually not be a real dynamic. So I'm, I'm very interested in looking at this. The fact is that it also probably doesn't have any ability to do membrane remodeling because it really doesn't have any way of binding to the membrane. So I'm interested in it because it does autophagy somehow, which also I don't know how. So yeah, more to come later. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.